thank you, Ben, for joining the interview of the DR Pioneers. But we would like to know how did you initially get engaged in, in DRR work, although it wasn't called DRR at that time, I presume? I refused to fight in the US Vietnam War. And my alternative to military service was to live in a Tanzanian um, cooperative village for two years from 1966 to 68. And uh, up to that point, I had studied philosophy. <laughs> so this was quite a shock to the system. Mm. Um, um, literally carrying water and hewing wood. Uh, it was a village uh, composed, uh, founded originally by uh, a group of young men in the Tanu Youth League. This was the, the, the then uh, party uh, before it became the Chamacha Mapunduzi as it is today. And uh, they were carving out uh, a farm, a large cooperative farm uh, in some old growth forest uh, in the, in the foreland uh, near the Indian Ocean on the Pangani River. And um, yeah, so I literally, literally cut trees and um, <laughs> drew my water from a well. And so uh, this was how I really became interested in what was then known as development. And uh, I think the the seeds, I mean, I had always been interested in, in first aid. I had been in the ski patrol and this and that, and uh, had had my life been different, um, I might in fact had, have done medicine, but uh, I didn't. And, and uh, but I had these interests from, from, from my early pre-adolescence onwards. So I, I was <clears throat> very struck by the way people were injured and became ill in, um, uh, the village, and even though I, you know, I wasn't a, a, a health worker, um, it was a time when um, the Tanzania was very interested in the whole notion of the barefoot doctor, and it was early days, and they had, um, and they had actually uh, sent somebody to the, the the district hospital for six months to study, and there's a whole sort of story behind this barefoot doctor notion as it was translated into various African countries. Um, um, and so I would, I would help this person. There were other, other, other events, uh, floods and so on and so forth. And um, uh, I left that village, not only with a strong interest in uh, what now might be known as development studies or critical development studies. Uh, uh, although I wasn't too critical yet of, 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 of the different forms of power that uh, were, were evident in, in the relationship between this village and the, you know, the regional and district governments, et cetera, and different powerful people in the village. But I was definitely interested in development and was becoming quite interested in what one might call human ecology, uh, particularly as it, the environment affects their, their health and well-being. So this was really the beginning. Um, I, early on after that, um, at um, uh, IDS Sussex and subsequently uh, I uh, was still working on my, my PhD dissertation and I had, I, I worked down some slopes from the mid slope of Mount Kenya, kind of in down into the the drier uh, foreland plateau and was weighing and measuring children and interviewing farmers in depth about uh, uh, what they do during drought. And so this, this, um, this early interest in development and in human ecology really kind of morphed into uh, a concern with food and food security and food systems it was food systems at the time. It wasn't political ecology or politics of food at the time, but food systems. Uh, and that's when the word security first kind of occurred in my, in my kind of day, everyday sort of professional uh, vocabulary. 
uh, and is the maybe origin of some, is why I'm attracted to disaster risk reduction or notions of, of, um, of social protection, because this, this idea of food security. So um, at the, at, when I was working on my dissertation, I couldn't help notice various forms that marginality took. So people were, could be literally geographically marginal to these centers of power. They could also be in very uh, difficult landscapes where it takes a lot of skill and good luck to make a living. So they were ecologically marginal, also uh, economically marginal. Uh, and I began to realize that there is some logic to all of this. So uh, I actually noticed that there was a migration of men up the slopes of Mount Kenya to work uh, on coffee plantations that were owned at that time by uh, wealthier Kenyans <clears throat> who had uh, earlier on uh, Kenyans were under colonialism were were banned from farming coffee. But after independence, uh, they began to and sort of acquired farms, uh, particularly when um, uh, smaller farmers who were in debt uh, lost their land, these farms got larger and sort of a, a sort of coffee bourgeoisie arose <clears throat> on the slopes of Mount Kenya. They were employing what I began to think of as drought migrants. And literally there was a kind of a pump going on. So, the, so, so bad years, drought would actually sort of pump this labor uphill, who would work. And at one point I realized through my interviews that many of these people were being paid not even in money, but in food. And it was food that these high, high, higher altitude coffee farmers didn't even eat. They planted cassava, mandioc, especially as a wage good, that they, so that you'd, 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 you'd trek uphill uh, 10, 15 miles from the lowlands. You'd work uh, cough, uh, 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 maintaining the coffee plantations. And then every, Every, every two weeks or so, you would trudge back downhill with a big bag of dried cassava for your family. That, and I, I, actually, I actually weighed, and I was quite quantitative in the day, back in the day, this is the sort of mid-70s. Mid um, I, I weighed the, the cassava and realized, and looked at the market price, and realized that this that, that I don't I don't think the coffee the coffee bourgeoisie had worked this out, but the way the system worked, it was uh, about half of the market price of cassava on the market if you were to go to a, a local market. So that um, there there was a kind of a political ecological logic to all of this, and I became quite angry quite uh, uh, and I began to sort of write reports and send them to friends of mine who had some connections with you know members of parliament and so forth and shop this stuff around of course nothing really changed uh, but it was the origins I suppose of um, yeah, of my concern with, with vulnerability. See, I haven't, haven't used that word yet. I think my, my, my work uh, is probably best known kind of as, as, um, as, as dealing with uh, uh, the way that vulnerability is constructed. Uh, and, and indeed, this form of marginality, which was the, the, the earlier organizing principle is, is part and parcel of vulnerability, but there's much more involved and uh, I was only going to sort of uncover that later as things went on. I should add that as I was, 
uh, discovering these things. Uh, I mean, it's almost like how what a silly word discovery. I mean, the the people suffering this exploitation, <laughs> the, the people on the ground. I mean, they they knew what was happening. But, but uh, before that, I mean, even in the in the 70s, you were already involved with Phil O'Keefe and Ken Westgate in writing a, a piece called Taking the Naturalness Out of Natural Disasters, which is still very much quoted uh, until today. And then you had also Global Systems and Local Disasters, the untapped power of, of people's science, I mean, which are two yeah. influential pieces. How did that come about? Because you, you, you started almost like a, a practitioner and then you, you, you came to the UK and, and then you started getting more and more engaged in, 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 in scientific and academic work. Or, and then you finished your PhD in, in 78, I think, no? Or, yeah, 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 so, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, in fact, uh, I was I was I was going to come to that uh, under the uh, under under the under under the second uh, or, or the, the the second question. question that you've got here about uh, major achievements in those early days uh, and challenges. Uh, precisely that point. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It was uh, it was also during that point that um, the nineteen seventy six. Uh, 1977 papers came out. Uh, the 1976 one is more is more commonly cited. Quite right, uh, and um, it was uh, where where did all of that come from? When I when I was uh, well. I had I had known Phil. <laughs> That's a whole other story. As you as you know, Phil has has unfortunately died, um, and that was quite a shock. Um, you know, I was in uh, having uh, FaceTime conversations with him and 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 emailing with him uh, right up until the, um, the the very the very end. Uh, when when we knew that he was ill, and um, I I had met I met Phil during during in 1972 uh, in in Kenya, and we were both doing our, our PhDs, and he was in the highlands and I was in the lowlands, and we sort of we we hung out in one another's um, study sites, and and drank a lot of beer and and. Um, sang a lot of songs. He was a great musician. Uh, and uh, he helped dig soil pits in uh, for soil samples in my area. And I helped organize a nutrition survey in his or in his area. We, we just we really had a, uh, a, a wonderful collaboration as well as a blossoming uh, friendship. So I've known him, uh, you know, and uh, when uh, all the rest of that that I recounted uh, had taken place, and I uh, came and I settled settled in 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 in, in England at the time, uh, and was at uh, a visitor at IDS Sussex, uh, but living in London, and uh, uh, Phil was in Bradford, in the northern part of England. And I would go up to, to to see him, and we would carry on drinking beer and singing songs. And uh, it was during that period that he and Ken Westgate, who you, you may also want to interview, who's in Australia now, and someone I've lost touch with, I really don't know how to get a hold of, called Alex Baird. Uh, the the four of us worked on. A, an occasional paper that came out in Bradford, yeah, I think in 1974, uh, maybe 75, maybe it's 75, that, that, uh, that, that, that talked about uh, the progression of, of disaster proneness. It didn't use the word vulnerability, interestingly enough. It talked about proneness. And uh, I, I became 
more and more uh, concerned with precision in terminology. And in fact, uh, as I get older, I get even crankier and more uh, uh, exacting about language because there's so much of it about, you know, there's resilience and well, that's, that can mean almost anything to anybody um, and so on and so forth. We'll come maybe come to that. Uh, but at the time, we, we, we were kind of searching for the language that we might use to incorporate the power relationships that we understood existed at different scales from, from the highly local, even the family scale where patriarchal power quite often would, would you know, allocate resources, even, even what people ate and um, all the way through the, 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 the scale through national and international. Uh, so that, that, that arose um, and, um, you know, eventually, you know, eventually, eventually these better known things that I've done with people, uh, with, with groups of people, uh, the book At Risk and then the second edition of the book At Risk, uh, they, uh, they, they somehow grew out of this, um, uh, how did you get to know the people from at risk? I mean, you were, how did you come to know them, uh, Terry and, and Ian Davis and uh, and Piers Blakey? Uh, how did you come to to engage with them in in in, in the publication? How did you do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, my my partner uh, Sonia. Brooks and I lived in Sheffield in 1976. Okay, I was fairly, you know, fa fairly, um, fairly new in terms of being settled academically uh, in in England, and I took a one-year teaching position uh, in agricultural geography at Sheffield, replacing for temporarily because he was on leave, uh, someone, um, uh, Professor Grigg. And, and again, this, this suited me fine because I was very interested in food and food studies and famine. And, and, uh, and this, this, as I say, was a kind of a, um, a, a mix of, of incipient political ecology and human ecology that was Kind of bubbling away and would eventually uh, give rise to some of this later work and, and more precise focus on vulnerability. So uh, I was in Sheffield. In fact, Terry Cannon was in the same city uh, at Sheffield Polytechnic, and I was at the university. And we we met. I think we met because he was doing some activist work. Uh, and I came along to a uh, to a meeting, and we hit it off, and of course went to the pub, and uh, really all the rest is history. Uh, he became a um, lifelong friend, and um, we we stayed in touch uh, once Sonia and I went back to London. I only had a one year job there in Sheffield, but we stayed in touch, didn't see a whole lot of each other until Terry moved to London. And actually, I believe in uh, around um, the late 80s, maybe 87, 88, uh, he and I uh, were sitting, sitting somewhere, uh, drinking beer, of course, and uh, thought, wouldn't it be an interesting idea uh, to um, pull together a book of readings uh, by people who are looking um, um, critically at, at power relationships in, 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 in disaster. And uh, we said, well, who could we get to help? And uh, Terry brought Ian Davis in to my best 
recall. In fact, the uh, uh, Ian uh, quite spontaneously, earlier, much earlier than than this, had come up with a, a sort of pressure. Yeah, pressure release model. That's what he, he was saying. He, pressure. Uh, with it, a progression it, of vulnerability and so on, he said he had it, written it. Up it, uh, it was the uh, so that the idea of representing representing this uh, as a um, as a visual diagram of pressure uh, was what really originated with him, and it was a, a, a and it and it uh, it served as a wonderful. Uh, organizing device, uh, and and of course over over the years uh, it's it's been elaborated and and uh, has spun off into different forms. Uh, in fact, I even have a crazy idea <laughs> I wrote down on a slip of paper by the bedside uh, the other day that it would be nice actually to do a an atlas of vulnerability that would actually actually provide uh, in some form for uh, for students and others wow. a whole variety of different variations on this on 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 this diagram as they've evolved and maybe some some historical text and, and come along with it but let's see whatever the the point is that uh, this was a major uh, a, a, it's what held us together, really, with because uh, Piers, I knew his work actually uh, because he's a geographer, and I knew his early work on migration and population geography, uh, and um, yes, I think I also, probably also knew his political economy of soil erosion in in. Uh, Developing countries, I think it's called. It was 1985, and so I I just rang him up. Uh, he was in East Anglia. You know, Terry and I were in London, and said, "Hey, we we what about what what about doing something together?" And uh, he 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 said, "Yeah, it sounds like a bad idea." And so we had a series of meetings uh, in East Anglia, and then uh, Ian hosted us in uh, the Chiviet Hills near Oxford, and we had some meetings in London, and uh, decided that um, there weren't, they didn't exist the appropriate uh, readings to actually put together an anthology that would say what we wanted to say, so basically we had to write a book. And uh, that's when uh, what was Formerly, um, Hutchinson got interested, and uh, a, it's it's morphed into various forms. It's now uh, it's now Routledge. I, I doubt seriously if there'll be a third edition. Uh, it's something that uh, Terry and I have knocked around as an idea. You uh, mentioned Piers that. Piers Piers uh, says he's really not. Not interested at this point. He's editing a poetry magazine, and uh, for all I know, he's still living in his thatched cottage uh, in East Anglia and still, uh, you know, making his own sausage and uh, and and sailing actually in a boat. So, and and Ian has produced a marvelous book of watercolors of Oxford, which you may have seen, and is giving walking tours of Oxford and is totally into his art and, and good on him. Uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful work. Uh, I, th I think that if a third edition ever appeared, it would have to be in the hands of um, a younger cohort. And Terry and I have talked about this. And Terry and I might be, might, might tag along kind of as 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 advisors in the, on the whole thing, but that's that's a whole other another story. I think the one significant reason why it might be difficult to do a third edition of at risk 
and why maybe something uh, completely different needs to be done is that uh, the world order has really changed in many respects. Uh, I think the, uh, I mean, literally the world as, as planet and the world as, as the ecumene, the uh, human uh, presence on the planet. Uh, COVID is just the first of many uh, microorganisms that uh, are arising and passing to humans precisely because of the uh, enormous impact that uh, we're having with uh, forest fragmentation and uh, encroachment. And uh, uh, we're in the tr tremendous amount of incident solar energy that we're actually capturing already. And um, this is only the beginning of the 21st century. So there's, there's this, and there's also the, uh, the whole question of governance and, uh, and where, where, where power and, and, and decision-making lie. And I think that these are, these are issues that uh, one could sort of nominally situate in a pressure and release framework <laughs> as, as sort of root causes, uh, particularly if one fleshed out enormously the underdeveloped uh, right-hand side of that, where it in the early version simply said, you know, hazards. And mostly it was, was looking at what produced unsafe conditions and fragile livelihoods. So one would, would have to flesh both sides out with the concerns for global climate change and uh, pandemic potential and so forth. Uh, I, I can see a return to what was known as the hazard paradigm as opposed to the vulnerability paradigm. In the hazard paradigm, it's that we human beings uh, are, we, 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 we suffer the whims of the planet, mother nature, and it's, it's for us to use technical means to control those forces of nature. And the whole problematic, the whole question of disaster risk becomes one of engineering, of, 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 of uh, plant science, uh, science of invasives, uh, you know, control, control, control. And uh, earlier on, the a perspective that said, all right, all of that exists, the hazards exist, but the starting point should also include dealing with the potential harm to human beings and to social institutions. And how in fact, do social institutions and the use of power actually increase the potential harm that hazards have on human beings? Let's ask that question as well. <clears throat> now that question was being asked in the early days and that vulnerability paradigm was gaining some traction. I mean, we weren't throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We weren't saying, oh, well, we, we don't have to worry about volcanoes or earthquakes. We don't have to worry about the climate or, or, or microorganisms. We just sort of sort ourselves out socially. <clears throat> Let's have some, some justice, equity. <clears throat> Let's stop oppressing minorities and then everything will be all right from a, from a disaster risk point of view. But we, we wanted a more balanced approach. It looked like it might be forthcoming and I'm afraid to say my sense is it's shifting back toward the hazard paradigm now. Does resilience play a role in all of that? And the concept, is there a resilience paradigm as a third alternative or is it one that kind of confirms the hazard paradigm more strongly or have you any thoughts on that? Because I mean, resilience is now like the, well, for the last 10 years, the, the, the concept that kind of dominates a lot of DR thinking. 
and uh, and that has kind of suppressed a bit the vulnerability thinking to some extent. Yeah. 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 I agree. I agree. And I said earlier that um, i that I'm I'm quite uh, critical of the use of of some some of the language and um, you know and the the word vulner the the word resilience is is certainly the the chief uh, I would say weasel word or slippery word um, resilience can be used in a um, in in a way to get uh, governments off the hook they can say oh well let's you know the the primary communities themselves these villages these neighborhoods they they should be resilient they should build their own resilience and and having 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 said that they basically are are offloading responsibility to the communities uh, that quite often don't have the the technical, the financial, uh, the legal uh, resources to to do any of that, and I that's that's one phenomenon one sees under this this circus tent that uh, that that covers all these different uses of the word resilience. The the other use of the word resilience I'm I'm skeptical of. Uh, concerns the fact that it's that's used in a highly reactive way. I mean, even if resources uh, are going to be applied, uh, again, uh, you know, economic, uh, political, technical, even legal resources. Even if you're going to legis and some countries have legislated, some cities have legislated. What they're doing is reacting to um, risk that is evident at, in a given, at a given point of time. And my concern and the concern I think of a more, uh, say radical uh, original notion that the vulnerability approach uh, had in it was to try to resist the creation of new risk. Where, see, the, 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 the resilience paradigm, if you will, that exists at the moment and is dominant in, as you say, among, uh, in many circles, it, doesn't inquire where risk comes from in the first place. It, uh, I mean, it can be quite useful in uh, dampening and in mediating and protecting up to a certain point. But the, as I said earlier, we're, we're in a, in a very different world now. Than, than we were uh, when the original sort of uh, opposition and, and debate between hazard and vulnerability was at its peak. Um, uh, I, I've been trying to avoid using the term Anthropocene, but, but we, we are in a period of, of geological history when uh, uh, human beings' dominance is evident, and the consequences are evident. And I, you know, I don't, I don't go from that into some sort of neo-Malthusian uh, 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 fantasy of reducing population and so on and so forth. But what, what I what I do think has to happen is that um, the is is that systems transform in such a way that they are producing for need and not for wants and desires and are no longer caught up in a in a um, 
in, in a system that just reproduces wants and desires and cravings. Uh, I think this would do a great deal. When, uh, I mean, another major development is the whole influence of climate thinking in, in DRR. Uh, yeah. It's also, I mean, it's also related to limits to the growth and all of that what you're, you're mentioning. Is there a risk that the focus on climate brings us back to modern nature or is there room for vulnerability thinking within within the climate paradigm or within the climate uh, realm? Oh, oh, certainly, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, before uh, before there was a concern. Uh, let me let me go around full circle and 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 remind you that um, my earliest interest was concerning um, food security and famine. And uh, some of my uh, earliest uh, inspirations came from books uh, such as uh, Claude Massus. He's, he's a, a French uh, anthropologist who worked in West Africa. He's now, he's now dead. Um, Claude Massu wrote uh, Qui se nourrit de la famine en Afrique? Who's getting nourished? Who's getting fat from the famine in West Africa? And uh, it was 1973. So he's looking at drought. He's looking at famine, but he's already in 73, he's, he's looking to see how do power relations shift? And, you know, he found that in fact, you know, in these various Sahelian countries, food and, and, and fiber was being exported even during the uh, worst days of the famine. Uh, I also, you read a, an author like Jose de Castro, his, you know, a book like a Geopolitics of Hunger, uh, Geografia do Fome, the Black Book of Hunger, which is Another of his uh, of his works is in translation. Jose de Castro, uh, in fact, was a medical doctor and a, a medical geographer. Uh, and when he looked at the northeast of Brazil, which is it has it's it's part of what's known as the drought polygon in in Brazil. Uh, he didn't fixate on the climate and on the soil. Uh, it was there, he wouldn't deny that this is a phenomenon, but he looked at, at power. This is already in studies in the 1950s. So I would say that uh, there is a huge uh, precedent of authors from uh, the 40s and 50s onwards, who have addressed climate crisis avant le mot. <laughs> these, these, these were not, um, um, they weren't dealing at the time with planetary climate instability, but they were dealing with um, very pronounced um, uh, situations, any one of which, whether it's whether it's any 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 flood, any particular drought, it's just that we're going to see we're going to see more of these, and in particular, they're going to be more intense. Uh, I, I think when we think about the, the climate crisis and climate thinking and and analysis. Uh, it would be a mistake to consider this to be a novel experience for, for human beings, for, 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 for scholars, for researchers, for, for activists. Uh, we, we, we've been here before and um, to, to dehistoricize uh, would be a mistake. We'd, we'd lose a lot of wisdom. We'd, we'd end up uh, wasting time going back over 
a ground that's been quite well covered. Uh, but maybe to conclude, I mean, you mentioned already some names of people who were very uh, influential in your in your own thinking, and this is uh, something which uh, I think I mean you're you're at the same time also an influencer for quite a lot of people, including myself. But who were the people at that time and until now who you see as your main uh, influencers, as it is called now, those who have really shaped your thinking? Mm. And um, you mentioned already a few people, but maybe there's more. Um, yeah, well, there, there, you know, there's several different ways of approaching this. I mean, um, unlike, unlike some of the uh, some of the. Uh, People you'll interview. Um, uh, I, 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 I come out of the nineteen late nineteen sixties and 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 early nineteen seventies in terms of my my concerns, as I said earlier. And there are those there are people who influenced me at that time. Uh, there are people who sort of have influenced me uh, along the way as, as I developed a, a vulnerability paradigm, if you will. And, and um, then there are people who kind of continue to uh, uh, nourish me as, a, as an author, as, a, uh, as an activist. Um, uh, you know, as I as I grow older, uh, I think I'd have to highlight uh, uh, Andrew Maskery with his uh, uh, 1987 book on um, on community based approaches to disaster. Andrew was very influential. And I think uh, had an important role because he worked both within uh, the UN system um, uh, first in in in, in UNDP, uh, but also came out of a, a network of people, uh, namely La Red. Uh, in in the Americas, uh, that um, was somewhat skeptical of systems, and so I I'd, I'd include along with Andrew, I'd include Alan Laval, and uh, someone who maybe isn't mentioned that much, but Gustavo Vilches Chao in Colombia. Uh, Gustavo, uh, I believe, is trained as a lawyer, and was an administrator in a very ambitious uh, early uh, uh, disaster resettlement program in Colombia. And I think became interested at that point and sort of never looked back in terms of, of trying to think about um, disaster risk and particularly um, how so-called recovery goes wrong. <clears throat> and, uh, so he's he's quite a quite a charming person as well, very articulate, and he uh, is a photographer, and very interested in uh, in nature. And then and then Ian Davis uh, I've mentioned before, uh, Terry Cannon of course <clears throat> I've mentioned before, John Twig is a person <clears throat> I've known uh, for. A long time, uh, and um, yeah, I met him for the first time when I began uh, an affiliation at University College London. So he was over in a corner uh, with all these interesting books, and uh, and and I I would I would chat with him, and he was a he he had his. He had an ability to, uh, to 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 
synthesize uh, in a way that I've that, that I really admire. And so the work he's done uh, on um, on um, community guidelines for disaster reduction uh, is, is, is phenomenal, where he's pulled all this experience and literature together. Now, through him, one interesting book he had, uh, he actually co-authored with somebody called Mihir Bhatt. Mm -hmm. Now, Mihir Bhatt is in Ahmedabad and um, founded something known, uh, I think, as the, uh, the All India uh, disaster mitigation institute, and uh, Mihir has been very influential throughout the subcontinent uh, and and beyond uh, in terms of 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 trying to put together uh, systems where non governmental and governmental uh, institutions cooperate around disaster reduction. And uh, I've been very impressed with, with me here over the years. I mean, all of these people are, I mean, interestingly enough, I mean, uh, maybe not all that surprising. I've, I've actually sat down with and talked and in, in quite often repeatedly with, with all of these people. I've gotten to know um, and it would be hard. So I think there are uh, there, there are people you read and and might influence your thinking, but I think more so uh, people people you've actually kind of interacted with uh, uh, as partners in projects or as as friends or simply you admire their work so much that you 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 take a side trip from some adventure somewhere and you go and actually find them and bang on their doors and talk to them. Uh, maybe to conclude, I mean, you, you mentioned a number of publications, I mean, uh, that have been like your key influences, but uh, I mean, you mentioned that Andrew Maskery's uh, disaster mitigation at community level, were there any others? I, you mentioned uh, Jose uh, de Castro, but any other books that you could advise the current and future researchers should read as a must read? I was very much influenced by um, a book that was, was actually written in 1934, but it's still in print. Uh, Routledge uh, offers it, uh, published, uh, republished in 2004. It's by C. Daryl Ford. Uh, D A R Y L L Ford with an E. Mm -hmm. Habitat, economy, and society. Uh -huh. And uh, it is a human ecological perspective uh, on on history, which is which, which really. I mean, I haven't looked back at it for some time, but it was. It was very influential. Uh, I mentioned, yeah, I, men I mentioned uh, De Castro, I mentioned Mayasu and Mascri. <laughs> I mentioned Mike Davis. Uh, the book I, I didn't mention uh, is by J. M. Blout, B. L. A. U. T. Uh -huh. And it's called The Colonizer's Model of the World published in 1993 uh, by Guilford, G-U-I-L-F-O-R-D, Guilford Press in New York. I mean, he wrote a book, uh, his, his, his partner was, was from Puerto Rico and he, was, he, 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 he felt very strongly about Puerto Rican independence. And he, 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 wrote, book, he wrote books both in Spanish and English on, uh, on, the, on Puerto Rican independence, uh, but he also uh, wrote a good deal uh, more generally about uh, the uh, distortions <clears throat> produced by um, Eurocentric history and, Euro and Eurocentric 
geography, particularly he was anti-diffusionist. Uh, that in an extreme form, extreme form of diffusionism would would claim that um, that all worthy, good, and and valuable things emanate from the West and then are disseminated, are diffused um, into the rest of the world. Um, so he, he took a very strong sort of polycentric uh, diffusion point of view, reminding people that, uh, you know, the Middle East and, 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 and China were, were great centers of culture, et cetera, et cetera. But he wrote this, this book that I th was the first volume of a three volume work he never finished, uh, Colonizer's Model of the World. And it's, it's a very, very strong kind of matrix framework to hold together a, uh, a critical view of, um, of history and, and geography. Thanks, Ben, a lot for having uh, been available for the interview. And I wish that very soon you'll be able to travel uh, and get out of your isolation, one year long isolation, and that we can possibly meet in, in Europe uh, either this summer or, or later this year. So I hope so. I yeah. sincerely hope so. Good luck. Good luck with this.